Hi, my name is Dr. Paul Mason and I'm a sports and exercise medicine physician from Sydney. Today, I'm going to take you on a tour of the evidence regarding the use of low carbohydrate and ketogenic diets by athletes. And like most topics in nutrition, myths and falsehoods abound. Among other things, we'll see that glycogen stores can be fully maintained by ketogenic athletes and high intensity performance can be maintained or even improved. One source of energy for exercising athletes is the glycogen stored in muscles in the liver. And about 600 grams of glycogen can provide for about 10,000 kilojoules of energy. And following the development of the percutaneous needle biopsy in the 1960s, glycogen, in particular muscle glycogen, was identified as the limiting fuel for high intensity exercise. And given that carbohydrates can help maintain and replenish glycogen stores, Carbohydrates eventually became considered to be essential for high-level exercise. Of course, the capacity of muscles in the liver to store the glucose that makes up carbohydrates as glycogen is finite. And when this spare capacity is exhausted, as you can see in this carbohydrate overfeeding study, excess glucose is turned into fat, which is then stored under the action of insulin. Which brings us to the other major store of energy for exercise, fat. In terms of potential energy, fat dwarfs glycogen stores. Even a 65 kilogram athlete with only 6% body fat will still have about 150,000 kilojoules of energy in fat stores. Unfortunately, on high carbohydrate diets, the energy stored in fat is largely inaccessible. This means that in longer events when glycogen stores are depleted, High carbohydrate athletes literally have to eat themselves to the finish. So then the question is, can ketogenic athletes utilize the energy from fat stores at a sufficient rate to support high intensity exercise? Now, there has been a well publicized study known as Supernova, which attempted to address this question. And the study was something of a logistical feat. 21 world-class race walkers were recruited from all around the world to follow either a high, low, or periodized carbohydrate diet for a period of three weeks. And at the end of the three weeks, race performance was assessed. The rate of fat oxidation in the high and periodized carbohydrate group during a 25 kilometer time trial did not improve. However, the rate of fat oxidation in the low carb athletes saw an impressive increase. In fact, some individuals in this study recorded a fat oxidation rate of over 1.9 grams a minute. Here is the problem though. Just because fat is oxidized doesn't mean that it's used effectively for energy. The process of keto adaptation, which allows the efficient use of fat for energy, takes significantly longer than the three week duration of the supernova study. So these athletes were breaking down fat but they weren't able to efficiently use the resulting products. To understand why, let's have a look at the production and use of ketones in the liver. First of all, free fatty acids enter the liver where they can be converted into ketones, in this case, beta-hydroxybutyrate. The beta-hydroxybutyrate then enters the circulation where it travels to the muscle and is transported inside. Once inside the muscle, there's a series of steps to convert the beta-hydroxybutyrate into acetyl-CoA so that it can enter the Krebs cycle and produce ATP for energy. Now, while this might all seem unnecessarily complex, that is exactly the point. Just because fat is oxidized doesn't mean it automatically turns into energy. And the transporters for beta-hydroxybutyrate to enter the muscle and the enzymes within the muscle which allow it to be converted to acetyl-CoA all take time to upregulate. So in the early stages of a ketogenic diet, the ketones which are inefficiently used begin to accumulate in the circulation, and this then requires clearance by the kidneys. And we can see this when we measure ketones in the urine. After starting a ketogenic diet, we usually detect quite high levels of urine and ketones initially, which reduce over time. And as an aside, this is one of the reasons behind the rapid weight loss seen following commencement of ketogenic diets. Potential energy is quite literally going down the drain, but for an athlete wanting to use every bit of available energy, this represents waste and inefficiency. 
And we can also see evidence of incomplete keto adaptation in the blood. You see, ketones compete with uric acid for entry into the urine, so that as serum ketones rise, they compete with uric acid for entry into the urine, and uric acid in the urine falls. This then results in a predictable increase in the amount of uric acid in the blood. And this is what I see in clinic. You can see in the above example that following commencement of a ketogenic diet, there was a spike in urate levels, which then normalized on the most recent blood test. In fact, the majority of studies demonstrate that it takes about four to six weeks after commencement of a ketogenic diet for uric acid levels to return to normal. This graph here, however, taken from a 2018 study, demonstrates that uric acid levels were still falling after 12 weeks of keto adaptation. In any case, keto adaptation takes significantly longer than three weeks. And anecdotally, many athletes don't feel they reach their full performance potential for about four to six months. So with this understanding that the low carb athletes in the supernova study were probably not fully keto adapted, despite their very high rates of fat oxidation, it's no surprise that they didn't significantly improve their race times. But rather than this being a finding against the ketogenic diet, it really should be just a call for research of a longer duration. The supernova study also found that the low carb group suffered impaired exercise efficiency, the graph here demonstrating increased oxygen use during a controlled exercise test. Again, this is not surprising given that the short duration of the study was insufficient to allow for full keto adaptation. Also of interest is that the authors of the supernova study were able to find an old paper from 1920 which supported their finding of reduced exercise efficiency on a high fat diet. Interestingly though, this study itself was also only three weeks in duration. So all that can be reasonably concluded is that exercise efficiency is reduced on a short-term ketogenic diet, which results in incomplete keto adaptation. Now, in addition to the short study duration, there are other significant limitations to the supernova study. One being the question of electrolytes, specifically sodium and potassium. Let's begin with sodium, which makes up about 40% of the weight of table salt and is essential to maintaining circulating blood volume. It's well established that reduced insulin levels, as seen on low carbon ketogenic diets, lead to much higher rates of sodium being lost in the urine. This is well known and not subject to debate. This occurs because there are four transporters in the kidney that all act to hold on to sodium, and these are all activated by insulin. This means that the lowering of insulin levels on low carb diets is actually permitting far more sodium to enter the urine where it can be lost from the body. And in fact, the loss of blood volume that results can cause postural dizziness. And this is the major mechanism of what was once called the Atkins flu. And given that low carb diets lead to increased salt losses, deliberate sodium supplementation on ketogenic diets is important. And this has been known for some time. In one of the original studies on ketogenic diets back in the 1980s, it was noted that three to five grams per day of sodium was necessary to maintain circulatory reserve. That is, sodium supplementation was required to ensure exercise capacity was not significantly impaired by reduced blood volume. And interestingly, salting food to taste was shown to be manifestly insufficient to meet this need and specific and aggressive supplementation was necessary. And it appears that sodium supplementation in the low carb athletes in the supernova study was not sufficient. Subjects in the low carb arm received only between one to three electrolyte drinks per week, and it wasn't specifically recorded how many they actually took. Their sodium intakes were almost certainly inadequate, especially considering they were advised to only salt their food to taste, a practice previously shown to be associated with sodium deficiency in ketogenic athletes. The story for potassium is not any better. Not only did those in the low carb group have a lower intake, their intake was even less than the recommended level for adequate intake as per our dietary guidelines. And like sodium, potassium is very important for optimal physical performance. In addition to electrolytes, there was also a significant deficit in micronutrients in the low carb arm when compared to the high carb arms. 
which is really surprising given that ketogenic food tends to actually have a higher nutrient density. This is a list of all the non-electrolyte micronutrients measured in the supernova study. And these were the ones that were shown to be lower in the low carb group. So clearly what was being assessed in the supernova study was not just a change in carbohydrate intake, but also a change in electrolytes and micronutrients, significant confounders. So while the supernova study was an impressive logistical feat, the results were totally confounded by its short duration and multiple electrolyte and micronutrient deficiencies. As a consequence, I don't believe the conclusions drawn were valid. So let's now change pace and look at some research on ketogenic diets whose subjects were probably keto adapted. This study, also on elite athletes, examined 20 ultramarathoners and Ironman distance triathletes, 10 who are on habitual high carb diets and 10 on habitual low carb diets. And those on the low carb diets had been on them for at least nine months. The exercise component of this study was a three hour run on a treadmill at an average intensity of 64% VO2 max. Predictably, and similar to the supernova study, there was a significant difference in the rate of fat oxidation between the two groups. Here you can see a mean peak rate of fat oxidation in the high carb group of 0.67 grams a minute, compared to a mean peak fat oxidation of 1.54 grams a minute in the low carb group. But remember, one of the main criticisms leveled against ketogenic diets is that they are unable to support exercise at higher intensities. That is, even though there's higher rate of fat oxidation, this is likely to be insufficient and to significantly decline at higher intensities. So let's see what happened to the rate of fat oxidation at higher exercise intensities. Now, an elite marathon runner will race at about 82% VO2 max. And at this intensity, you can see that the high carb athletes had very low rates of fat oxidation, not providing much energy at all. In contrast, the low carb athletes were still metabolizing on average more than one gram of fat every minute at this race pace marathon intensity. And this high rate of fat oxidation translated into significant carbohydrate sparing as shown in the graphics below. This study also looked at glycogen levels, which common wisdom states will be necessarily lower on ketogenic diets. And this is a big deal because if you accept that glycogen stores are lower on ketogenic diets, then it's only logical that high intensity performance and power would be deficient. So braver than me, each participant in this study consented to three muscle biopsies to accurately assess their muscle glycogen stores. And in what will be a surprise for many people, there was absolutely no difference in baseline glycogen levels between the high and low carb athletes. Glycogen levels in properly keto adapted athletes were not in the slightest deficient. Likewise, immediately after the three hour run, and then after a two hour recovery period, glycogen levels were similar between the two groups. And the high carb athletes were also provided with high carbohydrate shakes to help their recovery, while the low carb athletes were given high fat shakes. So we can really put to bed the myth that glycogen stores are always lower on ketogenic diets. And this means ketogenic athletes should be able to perform well in high intensity exercise without any loss of power. So let's have a look at a study which specifically tested power in keto adapted athletes. This study recruited high level endurance athletes from a range of sports, including triathlon, cycling and marathon. And they were then self-selected into either a low carb or a high carb group, which was combined with endurance, strength and high intensity interval training. At the end of the 12 week period, they were tested with a 100 kilometer time trial. And in the time trial, the high carb athletes improved by one minute and eight seconds on average, while the low carb group improved by just over four minutes. These differences though, were not statistically significant. What was statistically significant, however, was the differences in peak power output. Peak power on a six second sprint before the commencement of the time trial saw no benefit to the high carb group, but a small benefit in the low carb group. And immediately following the time trial, 
a critical power test where maximal power was maintained for three minutes, the high carb group saw a deterioration compared to an improvement in the low carb group. So the low carb athletes started with lower power on both these metrics and ended up higher when compared to the high carb group. So this paper certainly does not support the notion that ketogenic diets impair power output. And as already discussed, the supernova study found impaired exercise efficiency after a period of three weeks on a ketogenic diet. But the question is, have there been any studies of a longer duration that have looked at exercise efficiency? And this was a study from 1980, which examined exercise efficiency over a six week period. So subjects were placed on a ketogenic diet, which was well supplemented with electrolytes. But there was a twist. Because the subjects lost weight on the ketogenic diet, the final exercise test was performed wearing a weighted backpack to compensate for any weight loss. Now, while this introduces a potential confounder, the results were still significant. And it has to be said there was no exercise training performed over the course of the study. So at baseline, before any weight loss, the subjects were using 1.88 litres of oxygen per minute during a controlled exercise test. And when repeating this same exercise test six weeks later and wearing a weighted backpack compensating for any weight loss, their efficiency was improved so that they were only using 1.5 litres of oxygen a minute. And not only that, the subjects were able to walk for an average 55% further before exhaustion. So given these findings, it could be suggested that ketogenic diets with a sufficient period of keto adaptation can actually improve exercise efficiency in direct contradiction to the conclusion of the supernova study. And let's not forget that the oxygen load of making ketone bodies is borne by the liver. And when they're delivered to an exercising muscle, they're actually more efficient than carbohydrate substrates. Changing gear slightly, we come to a recent headline arising from an extension of the supernova study looking at bone health. Unfortunately, a lot of the headlines arising from this study completely misrepresented the evidence. The conclusions of this study were based on analysis of bone turnover markers in supernova athletes. Athletes who we know were incompletely keto adapted and had deficient intakes of sodium, potassium and several other micronutrients. And it's well known that inadequate intakes of sodium and potassium contribute to poor bone health. For example, one arm of the Women's Health Initiative study demonstrated that low levels of sodium intake were associated with a significantly higher risk of hip fracture. And dietary deficiency of potassium has also been shown to lead to impaired bone formation. Furthermore, the glycogen depletion associated with incomplete keto adaptation was suggested by the authors as being a significant factor in the results. So clearly the conclusions drawn have no validity for those on long-term ketogenic diets. Somewhat tangential, but important, is whether a specific nutritional intervention may actually improve bone health. Relative energy deficiency in sport, previously known as the female athlete triad, is strongly associated with poor bone health. And one of the major reasons for this is reduced energy availability, basically a deficiency in energy available for physiological functions, such as the maintenance of bone health. Well, ketogenic diets actually increase energy availability as the lowering of insulin permits the release of energy from fat stores. And this was elegantly shown in a study comparing participants on low, moderate and high carbohydrate diets. As shown in the graph, you can see the low carb group in blue had an increase in energy expenditure correlating to increased energy availability, while the high carb group had a reduction. And the difference between these groups was significant, about 278 kilocalories a day, which is equivalent to about an hour of moderate intensity exercise. And another factor critical to bone health is adequate protein intake. And this might surprise some people due to the widespread myth that high protein diets can be bad for the bone. But this myth arose from a finding about 100 years ago that high protein diets led to higher levels of calcium in the urine. But subsequent to that initial discovery, it's now well understood that this occurs secondary to increased calcium absorption through the intestines and that the net effect of protein on calcium retention in the body is positive. 
Here you can see that as protein intake increases, so too does the intestinal absorption of calcium. What you are looking at here is an electron micrograph of demineralized bone. You're basically looking at protein, collagen fibrils, which make up 40% of the dry weight of bone. This study from 2002 was ostensibly about vitamin D and calcium supplementation, but they also had a unique twist that allowed them to consider the importance of protein for bone health. So it was a randomized controlled trial looking at the effects of calcium and vitamin D supplementation in particular on bone mineral density, which was assessed by DEXA scanning over a three year period. And the study population consisted of males and females over the age of 65. Now, if you think logically about it, increasing calcium availability by giving these supplements may reduce the need to break down bone to excess calcium, slowing the progression of osteoporosis. But given that protein makes up 40% of the dry weight of bone, these supplements are missing an essential ingredient if the goal is to create new bone. So the authors did something quite clever. They stratified the study population into three groups based on their level of protein intake. And the group with the lowest tertiole of protein intake demonstrated a small reduction in their bone mineral density over the three year study period, despite supplementing with vitamin D and calcium. The group with the medium protein intake saw a slight improvement in bone mineral density, while the group with the highest protein intake saw a striking increase, a significant improvement in bone mineral density over a three year period with no drugs. And remember that this is a population who's over the age of 65, including about 50% postmenopausal females. I would add a word of caution here about calcium supplementation. There have been some studies which indicate calcium supplementation may actually increase the risk of all-cause mortality. So I'd recommend an adequate intake in the form of real food, or if that's not possible, combining calcium with vitamin K2, for which there's some evidence of reduced vascular calcification, as well as improved bone health. Now, one thing we've only touched on so far is the potential for low carb and ketogenic diets to improve body composition of athletes. There can be no debate that low carbohydrate diets are best for weight control. Between 2003 and 2018, there were 62 randomized controlled trials comparing low fat diets and low carbohydrate diets in terms of weight loss. 31 of these had statistically significant results. And here I have charted all of them. No cherry picking. The blue bars represent the amount of weight loss in the low carb group and the adjacent red bar, the amount of weight loss in the low fat group. And if you look at each pair of results, you'll see that the low carb arms lost more weight in every single study. And we see this in athletes too. This was a 30 day study comparing male gymnasts on low carb ketogenic diets to those on their usual high carb diets. The ketogenic gymnasts lost a significant amount of body fat over the 30 day period, while those on high carb diets did not. In addition, Despite losing body fat, the low carb athletes didn't lose any muscle, nor did they lose any strength or power. And the potential benefits of maintaining low body fat levels in athletes are obvious. With conventional high carb dietary regimens, many athletes deliberately cycle through periods of energy deficit leading up to competition because they are simply unable to maintain a competitive weight year round. And these periods of energy deficit reduce energy availability, impacting on training and compromising performance improvements. And as we've already seen, losing weight on ketogenic diets doesn't have to restrict energy availability. So next time you see an athlete with a borderline eating disorder trying to make weight, remember, controlling carbohydrate intake will probably help. So now for some thoughts in closing. For a long time, heavier than air flight was thought to be impossible. And then, following the maiden voyage of the right flyer, the conversation changed from whether flight was possible to how to make it better. And ketogenic diets are a bit like this. For a long time, it was thought that maintaining glycogen stores and optimal power was not possible on ketogenic diets, but now we know it is. So the conversation should not be about whether ketogenic diets have a role in sport, but rather, how can we make them better? And in the meantime, 
I'll be ensuring that any of my athletes trialing ketogenic diets are well educated regarding the need for electrolytes, protein, and understand the need for a proper adaptation period. Thank you.